Isaiah chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. The title of our message this morning is Begotten and Not Made. Begotten and Not Made. Taking a little break from our study in the book of Revelation. Uh, I had thought about teaching the book of Revelation this morning, and it talks in the book of Revelation, the section we're in, about half of the world's population being wiped out, and so I really didn't know how to tie that into a Christmas message. So I decided to do something that we did uh, Friday, Jim McGowan and myself, on Pastor's Point of View, uh, defending the virgin birth, and we got so many uh, wonderful comments on that that I thought I would share what we taught there in a sermon form uh, this morning. And uh, I would encourage you also to track with us uh, either by streaming or preferably your attendance, our Christmas Eve service, uh, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Um, kind of our format is to do some traditional Christmas songs. And you're going to have a brief message from me. And by that, I mean brief as in 10 minutes. And people don't think that's possible. But we have the recordings to prove that it, that it can be done. And uh, it's sort of a time to, you know, let, not let the materialism of the holiday sort of overtake its meaning. And we recognize that Christmas Eve is sort of a family time, and we try to be very respectful of that. But it's just an opportunity to sort of gather uh, as Christ's body with fellow believers and really focus our thoughts on the reason for the season of Jesus Christ. So I'd encourage you to, to look at that. In fact, we got some church members one time out of that. I think the whole Wren family, and they brought their extended family here, uh, came because of one single Christmas Eve service. And Janet Wren, as you know, helped put on our whole thing that we had with the children's program. So, you know... You never know what God is going to do with a single Christmas Eve service, do you? So praise God. Well, we're in the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. The title of our message this morning is Begotten and Not Made. And I'm very sad to say that we're in a time period where the doctrine of the virgin birth, which is what we're celebrating this uh, coming week, is under assault today, not even so much by liberals, people outside of Christendom, but by people within Christianity itself. One uh, well-known evangelical pastor identified the virgin birth in a recent podcast as a science-defying miracle that proves something about Jesus. He says, whether you believe the virgin birth story or not, this particular pastor went on to say, its literal factuality is not the point. Now, those are the words coming not from a liberal, but from a pastor within Christianity. The literal fact of the virgin birth of Christ is really not that big of a deal. Another uh, evangelical pastor said this, He said maybe the thought is that they had to come up with some myth about the birth of Jesus to give him some street cred later on. It's interesting because Matthew gives us a version of the birth of Jesus. Luke does not. Mark does not. John doesn't even mention it. Uh, I think I said that wrong. Luke does. Mark and John don't even mention it. And a lot has been made out of that. So, you know, it's only found in two books of the Bible, two Gospels, not the other two. So that would diminish its importance in the mind of this evangelical pastor. He goes on and he says, you have heard me say some version of this a million times. But if somebody can predict their own death and resurrection, I'm not all that concerned about how they got into the world. Because the whole resurrection thing is so amazing, and in fact, you should know this, Christianity does not hinge on the truth 
or even the stories about the birth of Jesus. It really hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in the mind of this particular evangelical pastor, what's really important is not the birth of Christ. That's kind of, kind of inconsequential. What's really important is the resurrection of Jesus. Now, we are here today, uh, not today, but from this pulpit, we will defend the literal resurrection of Jesus. And we will communicate to people its importance. But this particular pastor says that's all you need, the resurrection of Christ, which we believe in here. What you believe about the birth of Christ, whether it's a fact or whether it's a myth, is somewhat irrelevant. And one of the things to understand about theology is this. I have analogized it many times to dominoes in a row. If you knock over a single domino, the other ones start to topple very, very fast. And that's what I would like to demonstrate to you this morning in this special topical message entitled, Begotten and Not Made, Concerning the Virgin Birth of Jesus Christ, which we are celebrating this coming Tuesday. Why is the virgin birth of Christ, that Jesus was born of a virgin, why is that a big deal? Why is it something that should not be minimized? Why is it something that should not be marginalized? Why is it something that should not be explained away? And the answer is, if you start to tamper with the doctrine of the virgin birth of Christ, these seven dominoes that I have on the screen will start to fall over very, very rapidly. And in fact, I believe there is a reason why the devil himself in these last days is attacking this doctrine. He's attacking this doctrine because he understands that if you can gut, if you can rewrite, if you can obfuscate the virgin birth of Christ in the minds of people, Christianity itself will quickly topple. Therefore, I believe that the virgin birth of Christ is just as significant as the resurrection of Christ. If you don't have either, you don't have a Christianity that we know. We don't have a Savior that can save us from our sins. So the sermon outline this morning is as follows. Why the virgin birth? Seven reasons. Seven dominoes are protected if the virgin birth is true. These seven dominoes tumble, topple, collapse if the virgin birth is not true. First reason why the virgin birth is so significant is to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. God himself, hundreds and in some cases thousands of years in advance, said that when Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, comes into this world, he will be born of a virgin. And you don't have to look far into the Bible to see this. In fact, in Genesis 3, verse 15, we have the first messianic prophecy. Some refer to this as the proto-evangelium, meaning first gospel. The fall of man has just happened, Genesis 3. And now we see God's solution to man's problem of the fall, a coming Savior. And Genesis 3, verse 15 reads as follows. God says to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed, and notice this next expression, her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. There's coming one from the seed of the woman, Eve, who will take Satan's head and crush it. And you'll notice that this coming one is identified as her seed, the seed of the woman. Now, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, I thought the seed belonged to the man. Doesn't the man contain the sperm necessary to impregnate the woman. The seed should be his seed, shouldn't it? But that's not what your Bible says. Your Bible says her seed. So this is sort of the first clue, if you will, somewhat veiled, that the seed that the woman would possess, which would bring forth the Messiah, would not be the seed of a man. It would be something 
supernaturally transmitted or planted within her. Now, the prophecies continue. Notice Isaiah 7, verses 13 and 14. That's the passage I had you open up to. You know these verses well. It's on all your Christmas cards. And it says this, Then he said, Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a name and she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is a prophecy given probably 700 years before Jesus was born. 700 years is an awful long time, seven centuries. The United States of America has only been here 230 plus years. This is more than double, almost triple the length of the birthday of the United States of America, roughly speaking, and 700 years in advance, God says there's coming one who will be a Messiah, Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, and he will be born of a virgin. Now, when you begin to use Isaiah 7, verse 14, to argue for the virgin birth of Christ, you run into very quickly three counter arguments, and I want to share those with you very fast. Because when you're watching the mysteries of the Bible, A&E, the History Channel, etc., they bring on all of these scholars talking about how foolish it is for Christians to believe Isaiah 7, verse 14, has anything to do with Jesus Christ. The first argument that they use is the Hebrew word for virgin, translated virgin, is Alma. And they say, well, that's not even the Hebrew word for virgin. That just means a young woman, a young maiden of marriageable age. And the word that should have been used is betelah, for virgin. And so they believe that Isaiah 7 verse 14 is not even talking about the virgin birth of Christ. The problem with that is betelah doesn't always mean virgin. Over in the book of Joel chapter 1 verse 8, betelah means a widow. Now, just to show you how fast this argument will come at you, I was listening to a well-known talk show host that I uh, agree with on political things, uh, Dennis Prager, who I have a lot of respect for. But I was listening to him one time on the radio, and he starts all of a sudden going off on how silly it is to believe that Isaiah 7, verse 14, is a reference to Jesus Dennis Prager being Jewish, and he says, don't these Christians understand that the word Alma doesn't mean virgin? And the word Betula means virgin. And I thought to myself, I wish he would read Joel 1 verse 8. Because Joel 1 verse 8 is very clear that the word Betula does not always mean virgin. Second argument that they give is the Hebrew word Alma does not mean virgin. I say this over and over again. It just means a young woman of marriageable age. That's all it means. And let's respond to that, can we? Do a Hebrew word study on Alma sometime. Trace how that word is used in all of its context in the Old Testament. And what you'll discover is it's used about six times. I've got the references there on the screen. Genesis 24, 23, Exodus 2, verse 8, Psalm 68, verse 25, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, chapter 6, Proverbs 30, etc. And I would challenge anybody to show me any use where virgin can't apply. For example, the Genesis 24 passage is talking about Isaac's wife, future wife, Rebecca. I mean, is it so hard to imagine that she'd be a virgin? Maybe this day and age, the 21st century, it's hard to imagine, but not back in biblical times. It talks in the Song of Solomon about singers in Solomon's court. Is it too hard to believe that those singers would be virgins? So you can look at all of these usages and you can say, well, the word Alma could easily mean virgin in all of these usages. And beyond that, there is something that you may be familiar with, maybe you're not familiar with. It's called the Septuagint. I've got it 
uh, abbreviated there, the LXX, meaning 70, translated by 70 scholars in 70 days. And what it is, it's a Greek translation of Hebrew Bible roughly 200 years before Jesus showed up. A full two centuries before Jesus walked this earth, there was actually a translation of Hebrew Bible into Greek called the Septuagint. Why were they even messing around with that translation? Because of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great had made the Greek language in the intertestamental period the known language of the day. And so these folks wanted the Hebrew Bible, which we call the Old Testament, understood in Greek. And it's very interesting that when the Septuagint translators got to Isaiah 7 verse 14, the passage we referenced earlier, and saw the word Alma, do you know what word they used? They used the word Parthenos to translate it from Hebrew into Greek. You say, well, who cares? It means everything. Because Parthenos in the Greek language is a technical term that always means virgin. And so they apparently thought that Isaiah 7 verse 14 specifically was a prophecy about the virgin birth of Christ. And if all of that weren't enough, you have Matthew 1 verse 23. Matthew is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Greek New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, and he got to Matthew 1, 23, and he is quoting Isaiah 7, verse 14, and he translates the verse this way, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and she shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God is with us. Now, when Matthew got to the word Alma in Isaiah 7, verse 14, guess what Greek word he used? The same word the Septuagint translators used. Parthenos. So what is the point? The point is, I think Alma does mean virgin. And I think the Septuagint translators agree with me on that. And even more important than the Septuagint translators, Matthew writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit agrees with that interpretation. A third argument that people use to dismiss the virgin birth of Christ in Isaiah 7, verses 13 and 14, is they say, well, how does this have any relevance to the audience? I mean, Isaiah is talking about things happening in his own day. How does this have any relevance to the crisis that he was facing talking about someone that wouldn't be born 700 years later? And so they think that our position on it somehow removes the prophecy from the crisis of Isaiah's immediate day. And they say, you know, you know what? Uh, you know, virgin birth of Christ, that's not what it's talking about, Isaiah 7, because there's a kid born in Isaiah 8. Did you know that? There's a prophecy in Isaiah 7. There's a kid born in Isaiah 8. And they say, well, you know, that's how Isaiah 7 was fulfilled. Nothing to do with Jesus. Nothing to do with Christ. Nothing to do with Christmas. Just move right along, folks. The problem is when you start to scrutinize the details, you start to see very fast that Isaiah 7 was never fulfilled in Isaiah 8. The child that Isaiah is talking about in Isaiah 7 is named Emmanuel. The kid in Isaiah 8 is Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. Say that seven times fast. The child in Isaiah 7 is a blessing. The kid in Isaiah 8 is a sign of coming judgment. The the child in Isaiah 7 is born to a virgin. The child in Isaiah 8 is born to Isaiah's wife. Now, there's a reference to another child that I'll mention in just a moment named Sheer Jassib. His age is 12 in Isaiah 7. The child in Isaiah 8 is age 1 and 2. The child in Isaiah 7 is a Syrian judgment upon Judah, Old Testament times. The child in Isaiah 8 is a Syrian judgment upon Syria and Israel. And you see, this is what the History Channel is not going to tell you. 
They're not going to tell you all of those details. They're just going to try to sell you on this line that somehow the Isaiah 8 child is the fulfillment of the Isaiah 7 prophecy. And I'm here to tell you that's not true. Because the Isaiah 8 child is completely different than the child in Isaiah 7. And, you know, everybody says Isaiah 7 has to be relevant to the original audience. It can't be a prophecy 700 years in advance about a coming Messiah. Well, guess what else is in Isaiah? Isaiah 53. I hope we understand who Isaiah 53 is about. It's about Jesus In fact, that was the prophecy used to lead the Ethiopian eunuch to Christ in Acts 8. Philip, uh, as he's evangelizing the Ethiopian eunuch, understood Isaiah 53 as talking about Jesus Christ. No one has a problem with that. But all of a sudden they have some big problem with Isaiah 7 as being some kind of prophecy that doesn't relate to Isaiah's time period. You start playing games with Isaiah 7, and it's not long until you're playing games with Isaiah 53. And even beyond that, what does Isaiah say in Isaiah 7 verse 14 when he gives this prophecy? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a what? A sign. What is a sign? It's a miracle. So how in the world is a, is, a, is a child born naturally in Isaiah 8 a miracle or a sign? But the virgin birth, now that's a sign. That's a miracle. And one of the things to understand about Isaiah 7 is there's actually two threats happening. You might have a copy of your Bible there. Look at Isaiah 7. And notice verses 1 and 2, and this is what a lot of people miss. They don't put Isaiah 7, verses 13 and 14 into context. It says, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. Verse 1, the one I just read, is the crisis in Ahaz's day at the time of Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was born. But look at verse 2. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, the Armenians, let's see, Armenians have camped in Ephraim, the heart and the hearts of the people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Now we have a second crisis, a crisis to the Davidic line. You say, what's the Davidic line? It's the line coming from David to Jesus Christ. This particular conflict that was happening in Isaiah 7 is not one crisis, but two. Crisis A is to Ahaz, crisis B is to the Davidic line. So what you'll see in Isaiah 7 are two prophecies, not one. If you look at Isaiah 7 verse 3, God deals with crisis A, the crisis to Ahaz. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, go now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Sheer Jasub, At the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. God says to Isaiah, take your child, Sheer Jasub, and I want you to go and meet Ahaz, who is scared. Because of this impending political crisis. And the name of the son is Sheer Jasub. Now guess what Sheer Jasub means in Hebrew? A remnant will return. The presence of your son with Ahaz is going to calm him down and tell him that no matter what happens with these foreign powers, a remnant will come back. God sent Sheer Jasub with Isaiah to help with crisis A, the immediate crisis. But then there's a crisis B. What about the Davidic line leading to the Messiah? God says, okay, I'll take care of that crisis in verses 13 and 14. 
our passage. Notice Isaiah 7, verse 13. Did you catch how it started? Then he said, listen now, what? O house of David. That's crisis 2. That's crisis B. And how does God say crisis B is going to overcome? He says this. The Davidic line will not be blotted out until the Messiah comes. And by the way, you're going to know when the Messiah shows up because he's going to be born of a what? Born of a virgin. Did you catch what's going on here? Isaiah 7, verse 3, crisis A. Isaiah 7, verses 13 and 14, crisis B. That's how it's completely logical to take verses 13 and 14 as a futuristic prophecy, which has nothing to do with Isaiah's immediate time frame because God already dealt with the immediate crisis with Ahaz in verse 3, with the presence of Sheer Jassib. You're not getting this explanation, beloved, on the History Channel. By the way, when you get into verses 13 and 14, the prophecy of the virgin birth, it doesn't show up in English, but if you know Hebrew, it shows up real quick. The personal pronoun you, second person, shifts from singular to plural. And then back to singular again. If you look at verse 9 and verse 10, it uses you in the singular. Why is it using you in the singular? Because it's dealing with the crisis to Ahaz personally. Then you get into our territory. That's on all the Christmas cards. The virgin birth of the Messiah. And the personal pronoun you just shifted from singular to plural. You see it in verse 13. You see it in verse 14. Why does it shift from the singular to the plural? Because it's no longer dealing with Ahaz's personal problem. It's dealing with something collective, something national, which would involve the Davidic line. And then you get outside of verses 13 and 14, and what does it go right back to? Verse 16, verse 17, the U is singular again. Now, why the shift? Because in the surrounding verses, God is dealing with crisis A, the immediate crisis. But in the immediate verses, verses 13 and 14 that we read, God is dealing with crisis B, a national crisis and the Davidic throne. And in that mix, God says there's going to be a Messiah who's going to be virgin born. Don't let anybody make you feel foolish for taking Isaiah 7 verses 13 and 14 as a messianic prophecy and by the way what is that child called that's coming from a virgin his name is Emmanuel now Isaiah 7 through 12 is what is called the book of Emmanuel it's a book within the book it's a section within the book it's focusing on this coming one Emmanuel now who would that be We get a development of it in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. You know this verse too. It's on all your Christmas cards as well. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. The government will rest upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Now, who do you think that's talking about? Some kid born back in the 7th century? No, that's talking about the one that he just referenced in Isaiah 7, verses 13 and 14, this coming Messiah. This coming Messiah starts to be analyzed more in Isaiah 7. It says, The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of strength, the knowledge of the fear of the Lord. In fact, when he sets up his kingdom, the wolf will dwell with the lamb. I was in the zoo not long ago, and I noticed that wolf and lamb were in different cages. This is talking about a time period when the two were dwelling with one another. Peace in the animal kingdom. 
It says, verse 8, the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra and the weaned child will put his hand into the viper's nest. Would you allow your kids or grandkids to do that today? Oh, just go out back. We've got a nice viper's nest back there. Just stick your hand in there. No problems. They will neither hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's who Emmanuel is. He's going to bring those conditions to the earth one day in what is called the coming kingdom. Is that some child born in the se- back in Isaiah's day, the 7th century B.C.? Of course not. What am I really getting at here? I'm getting at a simple point. You fiddle with the virgin birth and you just toppled over a major domino in God's Word called messianic prophecy and that's a problem because god says jesus says john 10 35 the scripture cannot be broken what god says is going to happen and if any pastor stands up and says the virgin birth isn't important what's important is the resurrection of christ then we have a problem because god himself said through messianic prophecy that the Messiah is going to come forth and be born of a virgin. That's domino number one. Falls over. Domino number two is the virgin birth is necessary to emphasize Christ's humanity and deity. Who is Jesus Christ? Well, he is the incarnate Son of God. What does that mean? It means he's unique, being 100% God and 100% man in one individual, humanity added to eternally existent deity at the point of the virgin conception. That's when Jesus began with not just one nature, but two. The fancy name for that is the hypostatic union the enfleshment of God, God taking on human flesh. When did the whole thing start? The virgin conception. Two natures of Christ. And as you go through the Scripture, what you'll see is Jesus is very human without sin in His experiences. For example, He had to toil and labor with His own hands as a carpenter in a carpenter shop, Mark 6, verse 3. He had to work to survive just like anybody else. He experienced distress, Luke 22:44. He knew what it was like to be troubled, John 12, verse 27. This is why he can identify with you in your struggles and mine in my struggles, because he's walked in our shoes. He was thirsty, John 19, verse 28. He was hungry, Matthew 4, verse 2. He got tired, fatigued, John 4, verse 6. He felt sadness, John 11, verse 35. He even went through the frustrations that we go through where we just don't understand where is God in all of this. He didn't lapse into unbelief. But he wrestled with the same kind of questions that we wrestle with as beings that are finite. In fact, in his humanity, he didn't even know when he was coming back. Think about that. Matthew 24, verse 36. He even was tempted like we are tempted. Yet in his case, it was without sin. If you want to see the natural development of Jesus Christ and His humanity, look no further than Luke 2, verse 52, which says this, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom, intellectual growth, stature, physical growth, in favor with God, spiritual growth, and in favor with man, social growth. The natural stages of development He went through. But let me tell you something else about Jesus. He was God. He never relinquished deity when he walked on planet Earth. He retained it. He always has been God. He was God when he was here 2,000 years ago. And he will always be God. You say, well, how do you know that? John 1, 1. The Word was God. Well, who's the Word? 
John 1.14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who is Jesus Christ? He is, is He man or is He God? The answer is yes. He is the unique God-man. And isn't it interesting how the virgin birth of Christ brings out both facets of Jesus? His humanity is seen in the sense that He was born of a woman. In fact, the book of Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 of Jesus says, born of a woman, humanity. But his deity is seen in the fact that it was not just an ordinary birth. The woman that gave birth to Jesus Christ, Mary, at that time was a virgin. The virgin birth, supernatural. Born of a woman, natural. Virgin birth, referencing the deity of Christ. Born of a woman, representing the humanity of Christ. The concept of Jesus having two natures, humanity and deity, in one person, really starts to come into focus with the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, which brings out both beautifully. And if you tamper with the virgin birth of Christ, you're tampering with the two natures of Jesus. You're tampering with the hypostatic union of itself say well pastor what hills are you willing to die on i'll die on this hill i'll die on this hill defending the virgin birth of christ because if you don't have the virgin birth of christ you don't have christianity which takes us to a third domino that quickly falls over if we do not accept the virgin birth of Christ as literal, factual history. The third domino that falls over is you lose the emphasis on Christ's eternality. The fact that Jesus Christ has always been. There never was a time in which He was not. Oh, I hope you don't think that somehow the virgin birth of Christ started... The life of Christ. No. All that did is added humanity to eternally existent deity. But Jesus has always been. And he will always be. This is why many of the statements that he makes to the religious leaders of his day are so perplexing to them. John 8 verses 56 through 59 puts it this way. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not 50 years old, and that you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And they knew exactly what he was talking about, because verse 59 says, they picked up stones to throw at him, because Jesus himself hid himself and went out of the temple. Under the Mosaic law, if a mere man claims to be God, he's to be stoned to death. Leviticus 24, verse 16. They just thought Jesus had blasphemed. The problem is he wasn't blaspheming because he is God. He was God, he is God, he always will be God. And he makes a reference here to the fact that he was even around when God was dealing with Abraham. Now, when did that happen? Last Sunday? That's 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. Jesus says, I was around to see that. And so this idea of Jesus Christ, you can't think of him as somehow starting at some point. His humanity started at a point, but he has always been. He has always been the eternally existent second member of the Godhead. Now, there was a heretic Very early on in the life of the church, Christianity, a man named Arius, who challenged this. Arius even had a song, obviously I'm not going to sing it because I don't have an audio of it, (laughs) but it went with these words, there was a time in which he was not. And he almost convinced Christendom itself that Jesus had a beginning point. You say, well, pastor, I wish you'd teach something relevant. Well, here's the deal. The Jehovah's Witnesses, 
Not when, not if, but when they come to your house. You know those guys? They're going to say the exact same thing. They're going to tell you that Jesus Christ is a creation of God the Father. Jesus, therefore, had a beginning point. He is not eternally existent. And so what the Jehovah's Witnesses are teaching is recycled Arianism. As Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun, right? Heresies aren't new. I mean, this is exactly what Arius said. And consequently, Christendom developed a creed against Arius called the Creed of Nicaea. The Creed of Nicaea is designed to say Arius is wrong. And here's what the Creed said, written about A.D. 325. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of lights, very God of very God, watch this, watch this, begotten, but not made. The moment they put that clause, begotten and not made, into the creed at Nicaea, they were taking a stand against Arius and saying Arianism is wrong. Now, what does it mean here, begotten? You recognize that word just from simple Bible reading. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son of God. What does begotten even mean? Here's the Greek word for begotten, monogenes, translated begotten. Mono, you recognize that word from uh, monopoly. Someone has a monopoly on something. They're the sole owner. Mono means by itself. You recognize the word Guinness from a study of biology, a certain species or kind, sometimes called a Guinness or a genus, I guess is how you say that. You put those two words together, mono Guinness, and what it says is Jesus is one of a kind. Well, why is he one of a kind? Because there has never been and there never will be someone who has walked this earth that is fully God and fully man in one person. Begotten? Sure. One of a kind? Sure. Made? No way. Created? No, sir. Unique? Yes. But not created. You say, well, I thought this was a study on the virgin birth. What does this have to do with the virgin birth? It has everything to do with the virgin birth. Think about this for a minute. If Jesus had had a normal conception, as you have had, as I have had, you know what? He had a beginning point. Because I can mark my beginning to when that conception took place. Every natural conception marks a beginning point. You say, well, did Jesus have a beginning point? No, he did not, because his conception was not natural. His conception was miraculous. It was supernatural, and it had to be that way. And if it's not that way, then Jesus would have had a beginning point like the rest of us, and he would not be eternally existent. You knock over the virgin birth and suddenly you're in very dangerous territory because you're damaging the eternality of Jesus Christ. There's a fourth domino that falls over very fast if the virgin birth is not true. And that relates to the sinless perfection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only person that has ever walked the face of the earth that never sinned. In fact, he said in John 8, verse 46, to his enemies, which of you convicts me of sin? If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? Could you imagine standing in front of your enemies and saying, go ahead. Point out a sin in my life. I mean, we've had some modern politicians try to do that. Follow me around and see how pure I am and Lo and behold, it takes about two weeks to uncover all the dirt. Jesus is standing in front of the people that hated his guts and saying, go ahead, pull a skeleton out of the closet. In fact, this is why when Jesus was rushed through the judicial system to get him killed, the evidence brought against him was manufactured. 
Matthew 26, verse 59 says, Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so they might put him to death. Why do they rely on false testimony? Because there wasn't any true testimony. The man was sinless. And you know, you know a lot about people by, by asking the opinion of who knows those people the best. If you want to know about Andy Woods, you might ask a little question to my wife, Ann Woods, and she'll be able to produce uh, a truckload of problems. There were no closer people to Jesus than Peter and John, the inner circle. And have you read John's testimony about Jesus? 1 John 2, verse 1, he calls him Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John 3, 3, he is pure. 1 Peter 2, verse 22, he committed no sin or was any deceit found in his mouth. You say, well, this is all interesting, but what does it have to do with the virgin birth of Christ? Everything. The sin nature is something inherited from conception. Psalm 51 and verse 5, David said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. My mother conceived me. At the point of conception, I inherited a sin nature from Adam. And folks, biblically, guess who the sin nature is passed down through? The man. The women are saying, I knew that so. (laughs) The man with the seed passes it down. Romans 5 verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered to the world, and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. If Jesus had had a normal conception, he would have had a sin nature. You see that? But the virgin birth, the, the miracle that it was, allowed a single human being to be born into this world, A, with no beginning point, and B, with no sin nature. You start fiddling around with the virgin birth of Christ and saying, you know, it's not that important. And how Jesus got here is not that important. You're on very dangerous ground because now you're fiddling around with Christ's eternality, Number three, and Christ's sinlessness, number four. And if you start fiddling around with those two things, you're, you're going to find yourself in d- dangerous territory with number five because the whole bodily atonement starts to fall. You say, well, what's the bodily atonement? The bodily atonement is simply this Jesus stepped out of eternity into time to bear in his body. As our substitute, you have to have the word substitute here in this. He didn't just die on a cross to show us how to live. He didn't just die on a cross to show us how to be a good Joe or Joette or whatever. He died on a cross to absorb the wrath of God in my place. It should have been me on that cross. It should have been you. But he stepped into the line of fire and absorbed the wrath of holy God the Father in our place. That is what we mean by the bodily atonement. And the virgin birth is linked to the bodily atonement. Why is that? Because the thing to understand is the, is the sin that took place in Eden was eternal. It was an eternal offense against God himself And it actually brought to the human race an eternal consequence. It wasn't just somebody stepping out of line. There was an eternal ramification that came to the human race because of the sin of our forebears in Eden. And how do you fix an eternal problem exactly? Well, there's only one person that can do that. And that's eternal God himself. Only an eternal God can fix an eternal consequence. See, the Bible says things like the day you eat from the tree is the day you'll die. Romans 6 verse 23, the wages of sin is death. What kind of wages are we dealing with here? 
We're dealing with things that are outside of the human ability to fix. Things that are eternal in nature. A human being can't reverse this. A sole human being. Someone eternal has to fix this. And that's why the virgin birth is such a big deal. Because the virgin birth protected Christ's eternality. If the virgin birth didn't happen miraculously and he had a natural conception, then he would have had a beginning point. If he had a beginning point, he's not eternal. If he's not eternal, he's disqualified from serving in the bodily atonement. And beyond that, think about this for a minute. What kind of sacrifice does God accept? You know, you read the book of Malachi and God is so upset with the priests because the priests are bringing to the sacrificial system all of these animals that are blemished and God doesn't like that. And you learn from the book of Malachi that God doesn't accept any sacrifice. He accepts a perfect sacrifice. In fact, this principle is, is revealed as early as the Passover lamb in Exodus 12, verse 5. What kind of lamb would work to satisfy a holy God? Exodus 12, verse 5 says, Your lamb shall be unblemished, a male year old. You may take it from the sheep or t- from the goats, but it's very clear it must be unblemished. No spot, no blemish, no impurity, no imperfection, genetically pure. And that's why Jesus qualifies to be our substitute, because He's pure. 1 Peter chapter 1 and uh, verse 19, But with the precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is accepted as our sacrifice because of his purity. You say, well, what does this have to do with the virgin birth? If Jesus had had a normal conception, what would he have inherited? A sin nature. You inherit a sin nature, you're disqualified from being that great bodily atonement. Eternal God can fix an eternal problem. We need the virgin birth. Because the virgin birth protects that. A perfect substitute is the only thing that will be accepted. Jesus is qualified because the virgin birth protects that. You take away the virgin birth, you're taking away His eternality, you're taking away His sinless life, and He, it doesn't matter if He died on the cross. That's a sacrifice that God Himself will not accept. You go after the virgin birth, and isn't it interesting how all these dominoes just start to topple over so quickly? There's a sixth reason for the virgin birth, and that is to circumvent the curse of Jeconiah. All the way back in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 22 and verse 30, God pronounced a curse on an individual named Jeconiah. And it says this, Thus says the Lord God, Write this man down childless, a man who will not prosper in his days, for no man of his descendants will prosper sitting on the throne of David or of ruling against again in Judah. God says this, whole, this, this, this guy's whole lineage is under a curse. Because of things that Jeconiah did back in the days of Jeremiah. Now we have a big problem. Because the legal lineage leading to Jesus Christ through Joseph, which is described in Matthew chapter 1, guess who's in the lineage? Jeconiah is in the lineage. In fact, you'll find a reference to that in Matthew chapter 1. And verse 12, you'll see the various names in the genealogy. And right there in the middle of it is Jeconiah. And so if Jesus Christ is naturally born through that lineage, he's got the same curse on his life. Because God cursed all of the descendants 
of Jeconiah. And so how do we get out of this dilemma? The virgin birth is how you get out of it. If Jesus had had a normal conception, he would have been in that line. But God circumvented the whole thing by giving him a supernatural conception, making Joseph his legal father, but not his biological father. And all of a sudden, just like that, God says the curse of Jeconiah does not apply to Jesus Christ. Now, some of you should be worried about this. Because if he's brought out of the lineage of Matthew 1, then he's not qualified to fulfill the Davidic covenant, is he? I mean, don't you have to be a legal descendant of David to inherit the Davidic throne one day? Doesn't uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13 say, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever? The Messiah's got to come from David's line. But now we have Jesus Christ, not a biological heir of Joseph. It gets him out of the curse of Jeconiah, no problem. But does it take him out of the Davidic promises? And there's a lot of tension here about this, right? I mean, I know this this ought to be something you're up late at night worrying about. Not how you're going to pay for all those Christmas cards with your credit uh, Christmas Christmas gifts with your credit cards, but this ought to worry you. And we have an answer because there's another genealogy. Whew! Thank you, Lord. There's another genealogy in Luke 3, and this is tracing the genealogy of Jesus Christ through Mary. And guess who's in that genealogy? Luke 3, 31. A guy named Nathan. And guess who Nathan is related to? David. You see what the Lord just did here with his virgin birth? With the virgin birth, he took Jesus out of the curse of Jeconiah. And you say, well, wait a minute, what about the Davidic promises? Those have been rerouted. Not through his father, Joseph, but through his mother, Mary. So through the virgin birth, not only is Jesus outside the curse of Jeconiah, but he is still the inheritor to the Davidic promises. I mean, it is uh, mind-boggling mind-numbing what the Lord did through this virgin birth of Christ. And to have evangelical pastors with large following stand up and say it really doesn't matter is just, it's astounding to me that people can say that. I'm wondering at what point you quit calling them evangelical pastors. I don't think they're evangelical pastors anymore. I think they're false teachers They do not deserve the title pastor. They do not deserve the title Bible teacher. They do not deserve the title Protestant Christian, evangelical. They deserve the title false teacher because whether they know it or not, they are gutting Christianity by saying a word against the virgin birth of Christ. Even marginalizing the virgin birth of Christ, the whole thing collapses like a house of cards. God help us to understand this. The last reason why the virgin birth was so significant is to vindicate the New Testament. Well, it doesn't matter if it's a literal fact or not. The problem is the Bible tells you it's a literal fact. You'll find the virgin birth of Christ. You ought to gather your family around this Christmas Eve. After our Christmas service, by the way. And read to them Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Luke 1, 26 through 35. Luke 2, 1 through 19. Just so your hearts and minds as a family are focused on the reason for the season, Jesus Christ, His virgin birth. If you say the virgin birth is untrue, you're going right against what the Bible says. And this particular evangelical pastor that I'm quoting, he says, well, it's only mentioned in two books of of the Gospels. What kind of reasoning is that? I mean, how many times does God have to say something before we believe it? I mean, would Adam and Eve say when they ate from the tree of knowledge, well, Lord, you only told us to stay away from that tree one time. Once is enough, isn't it? But then it shows up a second time. 
And this guy says, well, it doesn't show up in Mark's Gospel. Well, there's a reason for that. First of all, Mark's Gospel was written after Matthew's Gospel. So why would Mark cover things that Matthew's already covered? Furthermore, Mark is portraying Jesus to Roman Christians as a suffering servant. In Greco-Roman times, a servant did not have a genealogy. It was unknown for a servant or a slave to have a genealogy. And because Mark is shaping his material to portray Christ in a certain way, he doesn't deny the virgin birth of Christ. He just doesn't dwell on it. He skips over it because that's not germane to Mark's purpose in writing. And this particular evangelical pastor says, well, it's not found in John's gospel. Well, it is found in John's gospel indirectly. Notice John 8, verse 41, and with this verse we'll close. This is the Pharisees speaking to Jesus. You are doing the deeds of your father, they said to him. We, us Pharisees, are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. They just accused Jesus of being an illegitimate child. They accused him of being born of a virgin because why did they do that? Because I think they had some kind of understanding of what happened in Mary's womb. That the birth and entrance of Christ into this world is abnormal. And they just took what was understood and twisted it around and said, the reason you don't have a biological father is because your mother was a fornicator. It's basically what they just said. You're an illegitimate child. They had some kind of understanding of what was happening and they simply twisted it around to suit their own purposes. But here's the deal, folks. With any doctrine, it's going to start affecting other ones very fast. Like dominoes falling over. Why is the virgin birth so significant? A, number one, to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. Genesis 3, verse 15. Isaiah 7, verses 13 and 14, which are very clear messianic prophecies related to the virgin birth of Christ. Number two, the virgin birth of Christ is something that is necessary to emphasize the God-man. 100% God and 100% man. Number three, the virgin birth is necessary to emphasize and protect Christ's eternality. And number four, his sinlessness. And if he wasn't eternal and sinless, then he can't be number five, the one who pays the penalty for our sins in his bodily atonement. And number six, you've got to have a virgin birth to circumvent the curse of Jeconiah and yet rewrite the the Davidic promises through Mary's lineage. And finally, number seven, you better have a virgin birth of Christ because your Bible says it's true. What does Jude say? Earnestly contend for the faith. Once and for all, deliver to the saints. Jude, verse 3. Right, Gabe? Gabe's teaching on Jude. That's what we're doing here, folks. We're defending the biblical record so that the offer of salvation can be open to anybody without any ambiguity or any confusion. What a, what a great time to be born spiritually this time of the year as we focus on the birth of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing it would be to receive Christ personally and be born spiritually. Jesus says to Nicodemus, no one can see, no one can enter without the spiritual birth. Physical birth of Jesus is wonderful, but it doesn't help someone until they trust what he did and receive the new birth. How do you receive the new birth? You trust in what Jesus did. Jesus said it is finished. You place your confidence and your hope for your future Not in yourself, not in your good works, not in what your favorite preacher says, but in Jesus, in his words, who said it is finished. You trust in him 
and Him alone for salvation, independent of yourself, which is the only way you can receive a gift from God by doing that. God won't accept us any other way. And as you trust Him and Him alone for the safekeeping of your soul, you find yourself, number one, receiving the gospel, but number two, the light goes on because the Holy Spirit, which had been convicting us of our need to do this, now comes into us and lives inside of us forever. And you're born again at that point. You're a new child of God. And our exhortation here at Sugarland Bible Church is for people to do this. People even listening via internet or social media, our exhortation is to do this. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Why not experience a new birth now during the very time period on our calendar where we celebrate the physical birth of Jesus Christ? I would invite people to do that right now as I'm talking. It's not necessary to raise a hand to do this, to join a church to do this, fill out a card to do this, give money to do this, make New Year's resolutions to do this. But it's just a matter of privacy between you and the Lord where you trust in Him and Him alone for salvation. If it's, it's something you can do in the privacy of your own mind and the quietness of your own heart as the Holy Spirit places you under conviction. If it's something that you need more explanation on. Although I don't know how to give a better explanation than this one here. But if it's something that you're still confused about, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for this time of the year. We're grateful for the virgin birth, better said, the virgin conception of Jesus, the Messiah. Help us to understand the significance of this doctrine that we might hold out a virgin-born and resurrected Christ as the only solution to a lost and dying world. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said. In Jesus' name and God's people said. This 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 name and God's people said.